Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and apologies for the slightly late start today, but we are nonetheless so happy to welcome you to our new summer series, which is called JTS Alumni in the World, Scholarship and Impact. So those who've been learning with us <clears throat> for a long time know that we normally feature JTS faculty and we decided to do something a little different this summer and bring in some of our many amazing alumni, especially um, scholars and academic physicians, um, but a handful of others as well, covering a wide range of topics, but all of which we thought um, were, you know, not overly esoteric and, um, and, and things that contemporary folks could, um, could really connect to and find meaning in and intellectual stimulation from um, and, and find relevance. So <clears throat> I'm so happy that you've all joined us and we're so pleased to have our alum, uh, alum of the Keck's Graduate School JTS, Dr. Lauren Strauss, kicking off the series today. She is professor of modern Jewish history at American University, and her session is called Jews in the American Political and Public Square. And uh, we'll share a slightly longer intro in a moment. Um, so first session of our new series, we don't have sponsors yet. We would love to invite you all to consider sponsoring um, we have three sponsorship levels, uh, 540, 1,800, Chacham, Sadiq, and Nabi. Uh, we're posting information on that in the chat. And we're so grateful um, for, for all of your support. I know many of you have made non-sponsorship donations as well upon registration. And we're, we're grateful for every single one. And it's what enables us to offer amazing programs like this. I would like to turn things over now to Tani Schwartz Herman, who organizes these programs. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so pleased to be beginning our new uh, summer series. And I just want to review for all of you the format for today's session. Dr. Strauss will pause for questions periodically throughout the class. We'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. Please use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. During the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Strauss. Since we receive a lot of questions, kindly express your question both clearly in complete sentences and also concisely. For any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or Ellie Gettinger. The PowerPoint presentation uh, will be screen shared during today's session. And I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Lauren Strauss. Dr. Dr. Strauss teaches Jewish history and Israel studies at the American University in Washington, D.C., where she also serves as director of undergraduate studies for the Jewish Studies Program. A scholar of American Jewish political and cultural history, her forthcoming book is Painting the Town Red, Jewish Visual Artists, Yiddish Culture, and Radical Politics in Interwar New York. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Strauss. Good afternoon. It's so great to be here. It's so exciting to be uh, speaking for my alma mater, uh, which was not actually called the Kex Graduate School when I graduated. And and uh, and I really want to thank you for inviting me and um, <clears throat> to Tani for um, being the point of contact and writing to me uh, a couple of months ago to invite me. Um, and also, um, I, I want to continue to thank my professors and advisors who uh, were my teachers when I was at JTS, especially uh, Dr. David Raskies, who uh, was my dissertation advisor, and Jack Wertheimer and others. Um, and uh, I also fondly recall working as a research assistant for um, a young professor who was a uh, not only a wonderful human being and a great scholar, but also uh, mentored me in several ways. And um, I wonder some days whatever happened to her. Her name is Shuli Schwartz. Um, 
So, uh, so I was, um, I've always been a, a, a very big fan and I was, I was very thrilled uh, that Dr. Schwartz uh, became the first woman uh, chancellor of JTS. So um, that, that's sort of the, the era that I'm, I'm coming from um, at JTS and uh, the seminary has changed and American Jewry has changed. Uh, but one thing that I have found actually is that no matter what period from the early 20th century, certainly onward, um, that uh, a lot of things in the world have changed is that American Jews behave in certain similar manners. And we, we will um, go through some of the main um, avenues of involvement and activism in the public square, as we call it, uh, both um, in the uh, sort of more private realm, um, in issues that relate specifically to the Jewish community in America, and also those that require um, a coalition building and contact with the other uh, with other communities. So first, a little story. Um, when I was very young, uh, I remember distinctly that my father came home one night from work, uh, half amused and half annoyed. A, a colleague had approached him to discuss the upcoming presidential election. And I don't remember which year it was. Um, the colleague was a white Christian man. And he actually said to my father, this is true, how will your people be voting in this election? Interesting politics you all have. Um, and, uh, and my father was so struck by this that he came home and he told us about it. Uh, first of all, the, the fact that um, this other doctor assumed that my father, an individual, spoke for a whole community, and also that um, there was something, quote, interesting about the politics, uh, or at least the perceived politics, of the American Jewish community. Um, so this taught me from a young age three things. First, that my people, uh, and they are, um, uh, clearly the man-man Jews were and are viewed as uh, by others as a unified body, oft often acting in concert. Um, uh, that might surprise anyone who has ever attended a Jewish board meeting, but uh, so be it. Um, and uh, number two, that it was assumed that Jews would be voting um, would be participating in the political process. Um, in other words, that it was known that Jews actively participated. And number three, that there was something, quote, interesting about the political behavior of American Jews that was even evident to those outside the group. Um, so in fact, America's Jews who have been here for more or less 370, 75 years, so predating the United States, of course, um, can easily be identified as the most politically active group per capita in the country, uh, at least since the beginning of the 20th century. And, um, and, and yet the Jewish population stands, depending on how you count, which is another controversial subject, stands at around 3%. Some people say as many as uh, much as 5%, some as little as 2.5%, but it's, it's not a lot. Um, and this too is a very important aspect of Jewish participation in the political system here, because it has often been stated that a democracy is judged primarily not on how it satisfies the majority, but on how it treats its minorities. That's really the balancing act of any democracy. And even though the most Jews who came to this country as immigrants, uh, pretty much all of them come from democracies. And one thing that that I find just um, just fascinating is how quickly Jewish immigrants uh, to this country have sort of assumed the mantle of political animal, even though they did not come from democracies. Um, 
there there was this realization by uh, Jews in America, even before some of them were citizens, that they needed to participate, not only to safeguard their own interests and to work uh, in cooperation with other minorities, but to realize the promise of America that by engaging with the political process, they were not only acting in their own self-interest, passing laws, et cetera, to protect themselves, but that by doing so, they actually were doing and continue to do something that is essential for the, uh, for the survival of democracy as it is. And it appears that that has always been, um, or certainly since the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th, century has been of uh, American Jews. So um, today uh, we're, we are going through a wide uh, sort of sweep. I'm only going to, to uh, it's an important juncture that exhibits or some of the ways in which American Jews have engaged with uh, the public square in America and some of the challenges that they have had. Um, uh, and, and in doing so, they have become a leading voice, whether through lobbying, protesting, educating, voting, serving in public service. As I sit here in uh, Washington, D.C., that's very much a part of my life. Um, so we're going to ask two questions, and I want you to sort of keep in your minds as uh, as I speak. First, what sets American Jews apart from other Americans and from other Jews, meaning elsewhere outside America in the political realm? And second, um, what are some of the major avenues through which they have participated. So um, political scientists like uh, Ken Wald, who wrote an excellent book on, on the subject, um, pull that up, The Foundations of American Jewish Liberalism. Uh, I will send you the sources afterwards, Tani. Um, he and others note that the classic profile of political behavior in a given community is usually shaped by obvious self-interest expectations that one's choices will give you the best chance at success in that system. It follows, therefore, that the Jewish vote should uh, should sort of migrate through the years, especially late in the 20th, early 21st century, um, and guarantee them the best opportunities for their own uh, advancement, wealth, uh, protection, et cetera. But often they have been, um, they have sort of voted not according to expectations of their um, sort of the rest of their uh, social, um, socioeconomic stratum. So we will take a look at, at sort of how this developed. Uh, before the ninth, before the end of the 19th century, we see a few examples of American Jews acting um, to engage the political system. Usually they do this, though, as either as individuals or to safeguard um, indi individual freedoms like freedom of, uh, of religion. Uh, so, for instance, around the time of the Civil War, right before the Civil War, in fact, um, in 1958-59, there was a reaction to the failed attempts of many Jews around the world to uh, secure the release of a little boy in Italy, a little Jewish boy in Italy, Edgardo Mortara, who had been kidnapped by agents of the Pope um, in, 19, in 1858. And uh, and he had been thought to be Catholic because he was mistakenly converted by his Catholic nanny. It's a fascinating story. Um, and Jews in the UK, uh, Jew Jews in England, and Jews in France, especially Adolphe Cremieux, and Jews to a lesser extent in America, all wanted their governments to lean heavily on the Pope, uh, and this was right before unified Italy, to secure the release of this little Jewish boy. It failed. It failed all around. 
despite various uh, powerful people, people like Cremieux who were involved in the French legal system, people like Moses Montefiore who was involved in, uh, in England, um, and also the American Jewish community. Although they founded something the following year called the Board of Delegates of American Israelites, Israelites being one of the preferred terms in the 19th century, for Jews. Uh, Jews didn't call themselves Jews usually in the public square until the 20th century. Um, the Board of Delegates also failed because they didn't really um, have much practice yet in acting as a corporate body. They talked about the, the rightness or the wrongness of this action. Um, they, they tried to prevail upon the, their respective go governments to do the right thing, but they didn't quite have a handle yet on how to argue as a corporate body that this was the best thing for the in the interests of the country in which they were living to promote the uh, uh, the freedom of religious freedom of someone else, as we'll see the idea of intervening for purposes of human rights in another country's politics did not come until much, much later. So this is one early example of an attempt by the American Jewish community to act that that wasn't successful. And there were various other um, other examples, especially the mid 19th century, that were sometimes successful sort of in mass fashion. It was not until the massive immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe that began in the 1880s that we really see a number of really a plethora of Jewish organizations uh, being founded that are avowedly in the interests of their people and engage politically with both the American uh, the American political system and also with sort of networks in the world. So some of those that you may have heard of include uh, the organization Hyas, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the now still famous uh, uh, refugee organization, refugee and immigrant uh, aid organization, a lesser known, very important UHT, United Hebrew Trades, which was a uh, an umbrella organization early on in the 1880s of sort of nascent Jewish unions um, and some early Jewish women's organizations like the NCJW, the National Council of Jewish Women, uh, which I think is the earliest one that still exists, 1893, um, and others. Then when we come to the turn of the century or uh, just post turn of the 20th century, uh, we see some other so-called Jewish defense organizations being created. Now, mind you, these are defense in a legal sense. These don't involve picking up weapons. Um, so the best known of those uh, uh, at, at this in this early uh, decade of the 20th century being the American Jewish Committee, which was founded in 1906 in direct response to a growing number of pogroms, anti-Jewish riots in the uh, Tsarist Empire, in the so-called Pale of Settlement, where the bulk of Jews in the empire were forced to live. So I'm going to start um, screen sharing with you and go through some images that will illustrate um, some of what's going on. <clears throat> Can you see that good? Great. Um, so... So starting here, uh, not on a happy note. Um, sorry, I just spilled water. Uh, uh, not on a happy note. We have uh, the evidence of some of these uh, victims of widespread pogroms. This is actually, these photos are actually from the second major wave 
of pogroms um, in the Tsarist Empire, the first being in the early 1880s after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. This is the second wave, much more destructive, uh, starting, uh, if you see the ruined Jewish home on the right, uh, uh, you see the evidence of the most famous pogrom of all in Kishinev in 1903. We also have these uh, very uh, wounded and battered survivors of <clears throat> a larger pogrom in Kiev uh, two years later. This was a widespread uh, wave of pogroms that mostly lasted from 1903 to 06. And, uh, and it also accompanied just um, uh, overwhelming poverty and overcrowding in this area that I mentioned, the Pale of Settlement, which by order of uh, Tsar Alexander III had been contracted after his father's assassination to, uh, to become smaller, thus uh, leading the Jews on the sort of outskirts of the of the pale of settlement to either move inward and uh, compound the overcrowding and disease and unemployment and homelessness or to leave and migrate usually west sometimes to countries in the east but usually west to western europe um, Germany, France, England, and also jumping across the pond to the United States. And that is, uh, that is really where the majority of the immigrants ended up. Of course, um, coming across uh, during the period of heightened immigration from around the world, not just Jews, but everywhere, um, in the into the United States, so that the Jews are coming, they're they're leaving not only the Pale of Settlement, but other countries as well, Austro-Hungary, um, the uh, the failing Ottoman Empire, and they're coming, they're they're moving west, and often coming to the United States during this 40 year period of approximately 1880 to 1920, 1881 to 1921 really, uh, where you see about 25 million immigrants coming into the United States, just flooding the gates, especially of Ellis Island, which opened in as a center in the 1890s and just flooding in every single day. And there really were not a lot of controls uh, on the flow of migrants. There were not a lot of, um, of uh, laws. There wasn't a lot of legislation on the books that kept out certain groups, except for Asian would-be immigrants under the so-called Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And for the most part, people would be kept out as individuals if they had certain diseases or if they were uh, thought to be um, problems in society like prostitutes or, uh, or criminals. But in general, the gates were pretty much open and people flowed in. The Jewish community largely stayed in the ports on the East Coast, from which uh, they had entered, especially Ellis Island um, and the New York area. It's estimated that up to 75% of the immigrants who came to the U.S. Um, through uh, through the ports in New York and the East Coast stayed in the New York area for at least a generation. So that leads to incredibly uh, crowded um, uh, conditions, especially in the immigrant areas and neighborhoods like the Lower East Side. But it also led to an incredible efflorescence of culture and involvement, especially Yiddish culture, since the majority of these immigrants were Yiddish speakers, and a, a, a real burgeoning of newspapers and uh, and writing poetry, belles lettres, uh, theater, the popularity of the Yiddish theater, satiric journals, like you'll see some of them, um, and also something uh, called settlement houses 
and Landsmannschaften. These are institutions that were created to help the immigrants. Settlement houses, not a specifically Jewish creation. Uh, one very famous one in, uh, in Chicago, Hull House, was run by Jane Addams, not Jewish, but they were adopted. This, this idea was adopted very, very fervently by, uh, by Jews, both earlier uh, comers, the so-called German Jews, uh, not all from Germany, but that's how they were classified, to create them as, uh, as ways for the immigrants coming in uh, for whom they felt they had responsibility to learn about being an American and learn about being a cultured person. And part of this was engaging with America, engaging with the political system. So the uh, the settlement houses, places like the Educational Alliance on East Broadway and Henry Street, this Henry Street settlement and university uh, settlement, these all had classes in how to become a cultured person, like classes in Shakespeare, uh, the Educational Alliance, something that I'm writing about uh, a lot in my book, had a world-class art school, the visual arts, where it trained some of the most important modern artists, people who were almost entirely immigrants or children of immigrants. But something else that they did at the, uh, the settlement houses was, um, here, here's another view of the crowding on the Lower East Side, was that they trained the immigrants in so-called civics and how, how to speak English, how to read legal language, how to write a proper letter. And as part of this, they, uh, they distributed copies of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, a bilingual edition you, you see here starting very early on, 1892, really at the beginning of this wave of immigration. And it is obvious that this is seen as an essential part of Americanization, of acclimating, acclimating to this country as important as learning how to use a gas stove, which was another thing that they taught them, or, uh, or learning about um, uh, navigating the streets of New York and other cities. Immigrants would memorize uh, not only for their citizenship tests, but as part of courses that they took, they would memorize documents and really commit them not only to their head, but to their hearts. And we see uh, very early on um, uh, evidence of immigrants participating in campaigning for political candidates, sometimes even before they themselves had the right to vote, uh, either because they were women and didn't have the right to vote until 1920, or because they were not yet citizens. Here's just one example of a Yiddish pamphlet in 1904 uh, promoting a vote for Teddy Roosevelt for president. Um, so another feature of the early um, the early sort of political profile of American Jews is that while this might surprise you uh, to see Yiddish support for Teddy Roosevelt, uh, because uh, he he may have been well he had his own political party for a while he may not fit what you might think of now as a um, as the typical sort of American Jewish uh, fealty to the Democratic Party. Uh, since he was not part of the Democratic Party, it was not unusual for those days because it was not until the 1930s that American Jews had uh, had a particular sort of um, party affiliation. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. But this is typical. You had people out campaigning for candidates. <clears throat> you, had, uh, you had people calling members of Congress and also uh, beginning to lobby. And you had people who were uh, well-known sort of leaders of the community, as well as the rank and file um, uh, people in the streets. Again, not necessarily even people who spoke fluent English or were citizens yet. Um, 
Another uh, another aspect of Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, and his administration leads us to another aspect of American Jewish political participation, and that is serving as uh, serving as government uh, figures, either elected officials or as appointed officials in an administration. So Roosevelt is actually the first president to, uh, to uh, the first president of the United States, I should say, uh, to appoint a Jew to his cabinet. And that is Oscar Strauss. Um, sadly, no relation to me. He's missing an S on the end. Um, I say sadly because the Strauss brothers, uh, Nathan Abraham and Oscar Strauss were uh, millionaires. Um, and, uh, and he was one of these brothers and he was the secretary of labor and commerce. And on as, as such, this is not the case anymore. As such, the Secretary of Labor and Commerce actually had responsibility for immigration to this country. So Teddy Roosevelt actually appointed a Jew, albeit definitely not an East European Jew. He definitely belongs to the German Jewish elite. Um, but as the person who is in charge of immigration policy in his administration. Um, so that's something that um, that is really of note and, and that would have been helpful uh, later on. So at this point in, in these early decades, up until the 1920s, the flood of Jews coming in from around the world is uh, will ultimately add up during this period to about two and a half million people, two and a half million Jews. Um, now that is about 10% of the 25 million immigrants coming into this country total from around the world. And one of the things that sets the Jewish immigrants apart is not only, and this partly explains their engagement with the political process, but not only that, but the fact that they saw it as almost entirely a one-way trip. They bought one-way tickets. They did not intend to come as many other groups did, uh, come for a few years, make money, and then go back home. Some of the East European Jews did return to Eastern Europe, but the vast majority stayed here. Um, it was also the only significant group that was a family migration that included people of every age, from very old to very young, and uh, and along with the Irish, it was the only group that had about equal numbers of men and women, adult men and women coming in. Uh, this would all uh, have a great impact on the uh, on the political involvement because the Jews coming in saw it as their home. They realized they recognized that it was imperative that they make a home here and that they um, try as much as possible to fashion the political system such that it would not only welcome them and enable more of them to come, but that it would be a place that would be comfortable for Jews and other minorities. From an early, early uh, time, including in this era, Jews started forming coalitions in the labor movement, which we'll see in a second, they formed coalitions with, especially with the Italian uh, immigrant population. And in many other ways, they uh, started to reach out to the African-American population. The founding of the NAACP in 1909 uh, saw uh, several Jews as founding members, especially Joel Spingarn, who would be the president, the longtime president of the NAACP. Um, so that that's just a taste of the coalitions that they're building, another form of political participation. Back to the women, though. Um, as part of the uh, waves and waves of migration um, uh, spreading across the world and coming into this country, uh, there were there were many problems that arose. I've mentioned things like disease, but another sort of you might call it a social disease was the uh, was the scourge of so-called at the time white slavery 
for what we call human trafficking. And it was uh, it was a major problem. Sadly, there were uh, Jews who were deeply involved on both sides, uh, particularly rings of East European Jewish men uh, who had sort of a, a triangle of activities from Eastern Europe where they would prey on especially young women uh, traveling alone, speak Yiddish to them, get them to uh, to trust their agents, and then often um, get them on boats to uh, either the United States or commonly Argentina. Um, this was so this was recognized as a Jewish problem. It was also a world problem. And Jewish women rose to the fore in fighting this international problem. I mentioned before NCJW and one of the early champions of activism, uh, even though they did not yet have the vote in the United States, was uh, were the women of NCJW in particular. And yes, this is her real name, Sadie American, best name ever. Uh, so so called uh, by her father, who um, who was very enthusiastic about becoming um, a citizen. Uh, and uh, and she and others um, become world uh, lobbyists, world crusaders, activists um, against um, uh, <clears throat> against human trafficking. They do things like print up uh, bilingual, sometimes trilingual pamphlets, for instance, to distribute in uh, centers of immigration in Eastern Europe where uh, immigrants or would-be migrants were taking by then predictable routes. They were all sort of going through the same uh, the same centers. Brody in the Austro-Hungarian Empire right over the border from the Tsarist Empire and Warsaw and other places the uh, NCJW and and uh, growing numbers of other women would print up these brochures and send representatives sometimes to centers uh, where the new migrants were gathering to warn uh, the Jews, especially young women traveling alone, what to look out for um, and uh, and how they might protect themselves. They also lobbied. They started to lobby again before they had the vote. They were lobbying. Uh, for protections from the American government, sending um, stricter controls to points points of of um, of entry in the United States. Um, women figure very prominently still in this uh, in this early time in uh, in many ways in the American Jewish. Uh, sort of political landscape and the American political landscape, probably most famously during this era, as <clears throat> as labor union members and uh, and strikers. And this uh, is one of the most famous of all, one of those famous figures of all, Clara Lemlich, the young labor leader who uh, became who really rose to fame during the strike of the uh, the, the so-called uprising of the 20,000 uh, in 1909, 1910, uh, when she uh, famously leaped up on a stage at Cooper Union here, uh, shown here, and interrupted the, uh, the, the what she felt were the droning speeches in English given by various male leaders of the um, of the of the unions, people like uh, Samuel Gompers. Uh, and Meyer London, uh, the future congressman, and she addressed the crowd in Yiddish and said, um, and and said, strike, strike, strike. Who will who will follow me in a strike? And the crowd roared, um, including the Italian girls who were uh, who, who were striking as well, who may have not have understood her Yiddish. And she then repurposes a. Um, a, uh, a, a very uh, classic piece of Jewish text. And she says, uh, she creates an oath, which I, I can't say verbatim here because she says it in Yiddish, uh, giving this in English. Uh, and she says, um, whoever, um, 
everything in English, uh, how, it, how it would, uh, sound, um, uh, for swearing fealty to the union, raise your right hand. If I forget the interests of the union, may my right hand forget its ability to work, et cetera. This might sound familiar if I forget the O Jerusalem, but she's repurposing it. Uh, it worked, the, the thousands followed her. They struck um, for months and months of a brutal, brutal uh, strike during freezing cold months and particularly cold winter in New York City. Um, some of the some of the strikers died, and um, and and many were beaten up. And finally, the strike started to wind down in uh, in February of 1910. Uh, but it was not formally over until a group of of interesting figures in this sort of constellation of American law and labor met and uh, and came up with what they thought was a good agreement to stop the strike. Um, and they uh, they included people uh, like Meyer London, who I mentioned before, who would be elected to Congress uh, for the first of three times in 1912. He was a Yiddish speaking socialist congressman. Um, so no, Bernie Sanders was not the first socialist Jew in Congress. And, uh, and so he sat in on these negotiations and several other uh, people, journalists, and uh, labor leaders, all Jews on both sides. And the, uh, the agreement that finally ended this strike was, uh, was struck by a labor lawyer in Boston named Louis Demitz Brandeis, who of course would six years later uh, become the first Jew on the, uh, on the uh, US Supreme Court. So to backtrack here and just sort of review some of the salient points of this, we have here people who are involved in, um, in Congress or in electoral politics, either at this juncture or with Meyer London uh, just two years later. We have lawyers engaging the American legal system to come up with what Brandeis uh, termed the so-called protocol of peace, which was the document that ended this major strike. We have uh, we have the, uh, the the sort of choice to rally and demonstrate. We have the choice to strike. We have educational materials that uh, political educational materials that are being written and distributed often in the languages that uh, that a given population needs in order to understand them most, which has become much more of of, um, of a practice in America these days. But American Jews were doing this early on. Uh, we have all of these methods of engagement already this early on. Unfortunately, at this juncture in time, after I, um, and I'll stop uh, for some questions for a few minutes after I uh, talk about this. Next, um, next issue. Uh, unfortunately, um, this uh, so-called protocol of peace was not foolproof. It, uh, it left out some signatories. So it got uh, for approximately 400 of the 450 um, shops that were striking to agree to its, uh, its um, protocols, things like not charging workers for the electricity that they used uh, to to make garments in a given factory, things like giving at least one five minute break per eight hours to uh, go outside and use the facilities, things like not locking doors and windows to prevent uh, workers from leaving. So most of the shops that were being struck uh, signed on to this, but unfortunately not all of them did and significantly the one called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory did not sign on and continued uh, operating. And as is well known, uh, <clears throat> less than a year later, it was the scene of the most uh, horrific workplace tragedy, a preventable tragedy um, that uh, was seen in the United States 
for 90 years from 1911, in this case, March 25th, 1911, until September 11th, 2001. Uh, this was the largest number of workers who were uh, who died in um, in a place of work in America. The so-called Triangle uh, Factory Fire, uh, which resulted in the deaths of 146 workers, was very uh, was 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 of course seen as a great tragedy, but it was also uh, it also rocketed around the world and became a rallying point for workers and their families and hundreds of thousands more people. Um, it, the scope of the tragedy and also, again, the entrance of the press as an important, uh, as an important political voice and the fact that photos of the tragedy were distributed and had an impact on public opinion uh, was really, um, uh, uh, really formative in creating what was a political, a social, but also political response to the tragedy. So what was this? Right after the, uh, the deaths, right after the tragedy, there was a funeral, there was a mass funeral, but there was also a mass rally. And, uh, and in this mass rally where an estimated uh, 300,000 marchers gathered, um, uh, uh, or uh, people gathered, I'm sorry, to, to watch the march, um, uh, members of locals of various unions marched behind their banners. So they were clearly seeing this tragedy and its fallout as a political tragedy and one with political solutions. So you see this in English. Uh, and you also see these um, a selection of cartoons from the Yiddish press that responded to the uh, to the tragedy, partly as uh, you can see my cursor in ways um, that show the the extraordinary mourning of and its sorrow in the immigrant community. Here we have. Uh, mourners at the graves of especially the unidentified victims who were too badly burned. But we also have at the bottom a very telling response. We have here um, a, a figure in uh, of sort of, of liberty, and she is labeled in Yiddish the East Side, meaning the the uh, the Jewish population on the Lower East Side. And she is taking her sword and she's pointing it at the heart of this creature. Who is this creature? He is labeled Murphy. Murphy was essentially the boss of New York local politics, the boss of Tammany Hall, uh, which had been responsible for um, workplace safety and, uh, and inspections and things like that. Clearly they had fallen down on the job, it says here, it says Tammany uh, down there. And what is the sword that she, the East Side is pointing at this boss? It is labeled the Yiddish vote, the Yiddish vote, the Jewish vote. So this is this real um, realization, even among this new immigrant population, that this is the way to threaten an elected official. Uh, and that's one way. And then this is the other way over here, also in the Yiddish satiric press. We see here the a record of the uh, the lawsuits that are filed um, in in response to the fire. Although those lawsuits were not as um, satisfactory as the as the uh, as the um, uh, claimants wanted. The Triangle Fire would lead to dozens of workplace safety laws. If you go to the website of OSHA, the uh, the Federal um, Workplace Safety Office right now, you will see in their history that they in fact were created also as a result of the political uh, upheaval and outrage following the fire. So I'm gonna stop for um, a minute before we jump on to our next uh, period of time to see if there are any questions. Thank you.
um, were there areas of um, of public uh, public engagement, public leadership, um, or kind of civic life where Jews were notably absent in this in this period? One person asked about um, teaching and university administration. I guess absent in a way that um, you know, not just because they were immigrants and hadn't gotten there yet, but sort of intentionally uh, not let in. I, I'm i not totally sure what you're asking or uh, where they were, if there were areas where... Where Jews didn't have a voice. Um, okay. Okay. It, I didn't know if you were asking about Jews in education. Um, uh, there were many areas where Jews, uh, as is well known, where, where that, that Jews were prohibited from um, <clears throat> from being members, from joining. Uh, there are private clubs and you know, well into you know, the, the 60s, even the 70s uh, that Jews can't join, but also there are uh, uh, there are entire professions that have sort of Jewish and non-Jewish versions. I met, I mentioned, and we'll mention a lot more in the legal profession and, uh, and also banking. So there are these sort of, uh, Yankee sort of Brahmin, Boston Brahmin firms, both in banking and in law, uh, where Jews are not welcome. And those are generally not, uh, not known to, champion uh, struggles of either immigrants or minorities, although I'm sure you can find exceptions to that. Uh, and uh, But Jews early in the 20th century, and we'll get to that a little bit more uh, in the next um, section, start to found their own firms. And so that is a way uh, around the this kind of exclusion that Jews and also other minorities will often find. Um, by creating, you know, through, left out of a country club, they create their own country club, but sort of more substantively uh, creating their own, um, their own uh, law firms, their own banks, also significantly their own schools. Now, this is way too early for this, but, uh, but as, um, as the 1920s go on and more and more Jews, often the children of immigrants, uh, really usually the second generation are entering universities, um, the uh, system that we know of as the quota system actually grows. It actually didn't exist earlier because it, it wasn't so much of an issue, but by the 1920s, um, in places like Columbia University, especially, which is uh, uh, one of the first to institute uh, to institute kind of soft quotas. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, even before Harvard, which then would follow uh, President Lowell, infamously um, instituting sort of ways of keeping Jews out without uh, without saying it outright. Um, this will be this will actually be a reaction to Jews becoming more immersed in the uh, upper echelons of American society. Early on, the period I just talked about, it wasn't so much of an issue, um, but it would be as the 20s and especially as the 30s wear on. Um, and um, as a proud grad graduate of undergrad, my BA of Brandeis University, um, that is, uh, is literally um, one Jewish response to being excluded from, from those arenas was to create not only, and this is very important to always keep in mind, not only a school that would accept Jews and not institute these sort of soft quotas and also harder quotas. Um, uh, by soft quotas, I mean asking uh, loaded questions about um, name changes. If this is your name now, what were your parents' names beforehand? Was anyone in your family born in another country? When did they come here? Um, what neighborhood did you, do you live in? Uh, ways of, of rooting out um, potential Jewish applicants. So, so it's important to realize that when the Jewish community responds to this, they not only create schools that, uh, that don't um, issue quotas for minorities, but um, uh, to 
to ensure that Jews can go to school, but very much in the spirit of coalition building and recognizing that Jews are safer when minorities are safer. They uh, they um, announced that their school is going to be an American Jewish community supported non-sectarian university that is open to all um, who uh, who meet its um, academic standards of admission. So so that's um, that was one way of of getting around these areas of exclusion. Thank you. Other question. Um, someone just apropos of what you were you were saying, someone mentioned Jews uh, founding their own hospitals as well. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. In almost every city, you have Jewish hospital or Mount Sinai, right? Um, <clears throat> someone asked if the Jewish influence on the unions um, included included the demand for a day off to observe. A Sabbath. If that is such a great question. Can we can we take credit for that? That's such a great question. No, <laughs> the answer is a resounding no. Um, uh, the uh, aside from the fact that um, many many of the the workers in the sweatshops and factories, uh, the garment industry and and uh, and elsewhere were not uh, religiously observant um, when they came to this country. Um, they saw it as a combination of a, um, as a necessity to keep a job, uh, but also as a, as a freedom of sorts from, from the old world, depending on who they were. Um, they were much more concerned with the idea of having an eight hour workday, or actually what they asked for in the protocol of peace was, um, I think a merely a 12 hour work day in high season that that's um, how much they were working and then uh, eventually down to eight hours. So no, they weren't, they were not going to ask about that. Although one of the earliest um, areas of involvement of American Jews, uh, certainly through the press was uh, that has to do with the Sabbath was Isaac Leeser, um, a, a religious Jewish figure in the middle of the 19th century, founder of the Occident, uh, the, the first um, significant American Jewish newspaper, uh, and his campaign against so-called blue laws, which forbade uh, businesses um, from being open on Sundays because uh, the, the people creating the blue laws didn't want people to, quote, work on the Sabbath. Of course, Sunday is the, is the Christian Sabbath, not the Jewish one. So this that wasn't an issue early on. But Isaac Leeser is also known as, as kind of one of the formative figures of American orthodoxy. So it the majority of the uh, of the labor movement was not as concerned with that. Right, they had more pressing things to focus on. Fun mm -hmm. fact: I live in the last remaining county in the U.S. of A. that has blue laws on Sunday. Wow, can't stand it. Um, okay, so final question for now. Um, on behalf of our uh, many Canadian friends um, uh, on the Zoom today, um, there was a question about. You, the trends that you're um, the trends that you're talking about in terms of um, public engagement how how much were they being paralleled in Canada if you know I do know that uh, I I don't know as much about Canada I do know that there um, there are uh, a number of people who came from a couple of tens of thousands of, of the Jews who came to the United States during that period of heightened immigration. Uh, it's kind of funny, if you look at the immigration maps, it says they came from Canada. And I, I, I always think like the map makers, uh, this particular map I'm thinking of needed to clarify a little more because clear, these weren't these weren't like longtime Canadian Jews who decided suddenly that they wanted to move to the Lower East Side. Uh, it was because there was uh, so much overcrowding and in East Coast, uh, United States East Coast ports that ships um, started coming to, more and more ships started coming to Canada. And also for a seven year period before World War One, 
Um, something called the Galveston Plan brought only about 10 or 15,000 Jews to Galveston, Texas, in again, in an effort to relieve some of the overcrowding. So a number of the same population, Yiddish speaking, socialist leaning uh, garment workers were going to Canada. I don't, I don't think that the, that the, the numbers warranted the same kind of political activism, though. But it's a great question. And there was, of course, after the war, um, after the World War II, I'm sorry, there was a, a, a wonderful, thriving um, Yiddish culture community there, mostly from Holocaust survivors, but that's later. I'm going to jump back in the interest of time. Um, and we're going to uh, we're going to move to well uh, briefly the nineteen twenties, but really the thirties and beyond. Um, do I need to share my screen again? Because it's showing the JTS thing. Yeah. You, you, should, you should be. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so in 1924, and we are now observing, commemorating, um, certainly not celebrating the 100th anniversary of this dramatic um, legislation, the so-called Johnson-Reed bill, uh, which follows a, a similar but less draconian bill three years earlier, um, puts, uh, it puts very strict limitations uh, for the first time, if you combine it with 1921, for the first time on immigration to this country. And uh, you see here um, uh, President Coolidge signing this 1924 bill, and, uh, and this really will uh, create an end to the period of mass migration into the United States. So that, as we will see in a minute, will create future problems for the world Jewish community, of course. But um, for now, it will sort of redirect the, uh, the focus of activism in the American Jew Jewish uh, community inward to look at both um, challenges and opportunities and also uh, other problems that aren't only specific to Jews inside the country. So this, this focus on immigration and the immigrants uh, lightens up a bit. Uh, one of those uh, really caused the lab of the entire 20th century uh, was the case of the so-called Scottsboro Boys. Uh, we would not use this title for them today. Um, it's how they are known. And they are um, nine uh, young men, nine uh, African-American young men who are arrested in um, Alabama in 1931 and falsely accused of the rape of uh of two white women, one of whom recants her testimony almost immediately, uh, but being young black men in Alabama in the early 1930s with an all white jury did not exactly ensure a fair trial. And indeed on based, almost no evidence, they are, eight of them are immediately condemned to death. And the youngest, uh, I think it was 13 at the time was, um, was uh, condemned to life in prison. Fortunately, these, these sentences were delayed and major, major appeals ensue from all around the country uh, and uh, legal defense is mounted by the NAACP, but also by the Communist Party, which convinces at first the defendants to use their lawyer, Sam Leibowitz, who is not himself a communist, but he is a very good defense lawyer and he's hired by the party to, uh, to defend the Scottsboro Boys. Now, why would the Communist Party um, care about this? Why would this obvious New York Jew, Sam Leibowitz, uh, and the Jewish community be so, so deeply involved in the case of the Scottsboro Boys, this gets back to the idea of coalition building and the importance of um, race, racial equality, which was a, uh, a part of the uh, not only the, the Communist Party platform, but also the entire Jewish left. 
And uh, Sam Leibowitz doesn't do such a great job. He gets their sentences uh, temporarily commuted. They have trial after trial. Some of them are released. It takes uh, almost two decades for the last of the Scottsboro boys to be released. But this whole time, especially in the 30s, there is major, major involvement of the Jewish left. They are the most outspoken. And this is um, a lithograph by one of the artists that I'm writing about, Louis Lozowick, um, uh, which is really revealing and explaining why uh why they related so, so much to this particular case, as they did to another uh, famous case in the late 20s, the arrest and eventual execution of Italian anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti. And this is because, as Lozowick would say about the creation of this lithograph, they saw themselves. They saw themselves in the arrest, in the suspicion of people who, um, who did not fit into the idea of, of uh, law-abiding citizens of this country, people who are, were outsiders either because they didn't speak English, like Sacco and Vanzetti, and were uh, immigrants affiliated with radical movements or because they were African-Americans in the South or frankly, the Midwest. Um, and Lozowick would, in doing this lithograph, I should add, he entered this lithograph in an art show uh, organized primarily by Jewish artists uh, in New York to raise money for the legal support of the Scottsboro Boys. And he said of himself, and it's hard to see in the background, this is about lynching in the South, but it's also a self-portrait. And indeed, this man does look like him. And in the background, you, you can see a little bit uh, a hooded KKK member, but Lozwick said that he also uh, dressed them in black, uh, because to him, it was reminiscent of the Black Hundreds, the name for the perpetrators of the pogroms in Russia in his youth. So he and so many others are conflating this kind of uh, prejudice and violence against a uh, an unprotected minority group in society with their own experience. And they're engaging in all different manner of political participation. Um, demonstrations and uh, legal methods to fight against it. Um, as, uh, as the years wore on in uh, the late 20s and especially through the 30s, the Jews had what to worry about in this country again. Uh, about themselves and others. People like Father Coughlin, the famous um, anti-Semitic uh, radio priest in Detroit, ironically himself an immigrant, he's from Canada uh, originally, sorry Canadians. Uh, he, um, he raised the awareness of Jews in the US that at a very, very fraught time, of course, in world history, that their position here might not be so secure after all. So they, uh, on one hand, work behind the scenes with the federal government to try to get Father Coughlin taken off the air, which only happens in 1942 after the US joins uh, World War II and his message of isolationism isn't welcome anymore. But they also try and fail to open up the gates of immigration uh, once again to the Jews who are desperately trying to get out of Europe. Um, this is one, only the most uh, dramatic, best known example of the US closing the gates of the country to would be Jewish immigrants from Europe. After the war, uh, Jews in the United States were, for the next uh, two decades, really, were straddling a very, very delicate line as citizens. Because on the one hand, they had seen what happened in the rest of the world when authoritarian societies took over uh, and when threats to Jews were realized. 
Um, so you see here, and another one of the artists I study here is, um, is hired and you can see at the bottom by, interestingly, by the CIO, not yet affiliated with the AFL, uh, but the, the labor unions are encouraging people to vote as their civic responsibility, their civic right. So on the one hand, Jews in America are breathing a sigh of relief that they're here, that they weren't stuck in Europe, but they're, they're nervous enough uh, about their own position, especially as, uh, as the late 1940s wear into the 1950s. And again, voices are raised against suspect immigrant groups, outsiders, leftists, and of course, I'm talking about the creation in 1947 or the really rebirth in 1947 of a congressional committee known as HUAC, the House Un-American Affairs Committee, um, and uh, an entrance into the McCarthy era. Now, we don't have time to go into all of the nuances, but this is really a fascinating and often overlooked era, the late 1940s to the early 60s, when Jews in America are, are very, very involved in all different aspects, again, uh, on the political spectrum of engaging with this question of minority rights, who has the right to exist in society, to enter society, um, how do you ensure not only your safety, but also the safety and security of others? Is it by building coalitions? Is it by ingratiating yourselves with the, those who hold power? And the American Jewish community would make uh, sort of uh, different choices, would be on a whole spectrum of choices. Usually, though, they fell on the side of being involved in, uh, we might call them classically liberal structures struggles, um, most famously things like the uh, the decision in 19, um, we're actually celebrating an anniversary of this uh, right now, the 1954 landmark watershed <clears throat> uh, legal case of Brown versus Board of Education, um, who was chosen by a, a Jewish um lawyer, Jack Greenberg, you have right here, um, sitting next to Teddy Kennedy. He was chosen, he was handpicked by Thurgood Marshall, who had just been elevated to the federal bench to argue Brown v. Board in the Supreme Court. Okay, little, little known fact that this is a Jewish lawyer who is arguing this case and it is said, I'll just read you um, a quote uh, after, after he died, that about Jack Greenberg, who, by the way, argued 40 cases in the Supreme Court, many of them having to do with fighting against segregation and employment discrimination um, and against the death penalty. Uh, on his death, the he head of the NAACP, said, few understand how powerfully Jack Greenberg shaped the practice of civil rights law and the breadth of his contributions to our modern conception of equal opportunity and justice. A very lovely quote by Sherilyn Eiffel, who was the, uh, the, the uh, president of the NAACP. Um, but what's really interesting to me is that at the same time, a, a quote by Greenberg himself is very telling. He recalls his arguing before the Supreme Court as follows, uh, before Brown v. Board, but including that, quote, it was like a religious experience, says this secular Jew. The first few times I was there, I was full of awe. I had an almost tactile feeling. The first time I was in the court, I wasn't arguing. I felt as if I were in synagogue and reached to see whether or not I had a yarmulke on. I thought I ought to have one on. So this just says so much about the self-conception of Jews, including second, third generation American Jews uh, who are here, who are not necessarily uh, religiously active, but do also 
recognize that they are doing this as Americans, as lawyers, as political actors, but also as Jews, um, and also how they are seen by others, including in one of their important coalition uh, fellows, the NAACP. Um, this stretches, again, in this fraught period when Jews are um, the uh, per capita, the leading suspects um, uh, in front of being called in front of HUAC, whether it's because they were in the film industry or, or otherwise in the arts or teachers, all of the above. Uh, Jews are represented heavily, but at the same time, they're not only arguing these highly suspect civil rights cases in the courts, but they are actually engaging before the sort of much vaunted moments of the civil rights movement that many of us are familiar with. They're engaging in things like civil disobedience training. And here are some older American Jewish um, uh, Miami residents uh, learning about civil rights activism and civil disobedience training. And here is, uh, is a class being taught by a young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so this, a lot of this predates uh, what, we, uh, what we generally think of as the heyday of American Jewish political activism um, in things like the civil rights movement. Uh, we see here um, a, a scene from my neighborhood here in, uh, well, near me, this is Bethesda, Maryland. And this is yet another example of exercising all different, um, all different modes of political participation to make advances in the society for themselves, for the Jews, as Jews, but also for others. This is an amusement park uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and it happens to be across the street from a, uh, a neighborhood in Bethesda called Bannockburn. I was delighted to learn that Bannockburn was really created, was what we would call today an intentional community, was created in the 19, late 1930s and 1940s by a group of left-leaning Jewish um, uh, political workers who had come down mostly from New York to work in Washington uh, during the New Deal and after for the uh, Roosevelt administration. And they were banned from living in a number of the sort of nicer neighborhoods in the DC and Bethesda areas by housing covenants that also banned black and often Catholic uh, Americans from living there. So they bought tracts of land that happened to be across from this amusement park that also happened to be segregated, did not permit Blacks to enter, to go on the rides. So in the summer of 1960, a group of students from Howard University, the, uh, the famed um, HBCU uh, University in, in Washington, uh, began to picket and engage in civil disobedience, daring to sit on the, the famous uh, merry-go-round at Glen Echo and being arrested for that, and uh, and 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 uh, sort of engaging in in those uh, modes of activism. Enter some of the neighbors from Bannockburn, some of the Jewish neighbors who in the fall, after seeing these young black activists, decided to join them doing what they could. One of those neighbors was Hyman Bookbinder of the American Jewish Committee. And he and his neighbors came out to help and pick it. But Bookbinder realized something. He realized that Part of Glen Echo Park, I'm sure he looked at maps, part of Glen Echo Park was on federal land. It had recently been uh, struck down in the courts that, um, uh, that segregation was now illegal on federal land. He went to the Attorney General of the United States in his guise as a lawyer and as a representative of the American Jewish Committee and the Attorney General, Bobby Kennedy, listened to him, where as 
Bookbinder argued uh, or pointed out to him that segregation was occurring on federal land. All of a sudden, the uh, the owners of Glen Echo got an ultimatum from the federal government. Um, you have a choice. You can either desegregate or shut down. They actually chose to shut down temporarily. But this is another example of lawyers, uh, Jewish lawyers, engaging with uh, not only the political uh, process, but also in coalition with others. Um, I include this uh, because it's very important to me. This is the March on Washington in 1963. And at the head of the march, here, of course, you see Dr. King and uh, and James Farmer and other uh, other leaders. We see this short little man here, who is Rabbi Dr. Joachim Prince, um, a refugee from Hitler's Germany at the time, the head of the uh, American Jewish Congress, and my rabbi, who officiated in my bat mitzvah. Um, so we. Uh, so we see here in the uh, this sort of heyday of big ticket uh, demonstrations, rallies, things like that, a nuance that a lot of people aren't familiar with, um, that, that American Jews are engaging not only with, uh, with actions like those of the, uh, the, the martyred um, core volunteers, core Congress on Racial Equality, volunteers who were murdered in Neshoba County, Mississippi in the summer of 1964 as they are, uh, as they are trying to register uh, voters, but, but in many, many, many different ways. Um, one, other, uh, one other lawyer I want to mention and I'll take questions uh, another two minutes. Uh, one other lawyer I want to mention was Joe Rao, even though it says junior, um, he was Jewish. Uh, that was part of his sort of uh, assimilated uh, background. He's a lawyer from Cincinnati, and he basically authored the uh, Fair Housing Act as an advisor to LBJ in 1968, uh, again, to fight against something that Jews had come up against, but also that African-Americans, Catholics, other immigrants had come up against, uh, and that is discrimination in housing. Um, now, to skip, uh, to skip ahead to um, um, a more recent, I'm going to stop uh, sharing. Uh, to a more recent uh, era in our history. Um, I, I want to just uh, talk about a turn that the, uh, that the community took at the, in the late 60s and which some people are revisiting now. And it really leads to questions and gets us back to, uh, to some of the questions that I asked uh, at the beginning. And that is, um, what is, uh, not only what are some of the avenues that I hope I've shown you through which people can uh, participate in the American political system, but also um, what, if anything, separates American Jews from other Americans and, and should it, should it continue? Should American Jews uh, look at themselves as a single corporate entity or as a larger uh, um, uh, you know, a uh, larger part of minority groups in America. So uh, just to bring up the, the turn of events at the end of the 1960s, this these sort of halcyon days of the civil rights movement um, did begin to change in whether it's 1967, 68, people have different, uh, different points where they uh, where they see the the coalition, especially with the African American community, starting to break up. Why was this? Did it have to do with uh, the the two populations having uh, um, arrived at different socioeconomic uh, levels in this country? 
Did it have to do with events in the Middle East, which might cause us some deja vu right now, and particularly the aftermath of the war in 1967? Uh, did it have to do with, um, with the rise of certain issues like affirmative action and other issues that uh, that Jews didn't necessarily see eye to eye with uh, other minority communities on, or was it uh, perhaps the slide toward being part more part of the establishment as more and more Jews entered uh, politics and uh, and some of them in fact identified some more of them identified as conservatives or uh, a new term neocons. Why why did this shift start to happen? But it's very interesting when we look at the years from the eight, the 70s through the 80s and beyond that uh, American Jews have this, as the man said to my father when he asked how he was voting, this peculiar, this interesting political profile that Jews continue to care about the American Jewish community and the world Jewish community, increasingly about Israel's fate, but also uh, about the, uh, the fate of Soviet Jewry as well. Um, and at the same time, continued to vote uh, for sort of reliably liberal positions like uh, like busing um, to integrate uh, education and, as I said, to fight for fair housing and, uh, and higher uh, rates of taxes for social service programs. That continued even through um, the uh, foreign policy challenges of the of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So question, and if you can ask me this, um, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll go into questioning now. The question is why, why? And where does it leave the community now? What is the profile of the American Jewish community now? Um, is it more an inwardly focused uh, 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 community that is understandably worried about its own fate and its own interests, or does it continue despite the challenges to recognize itself as part of a larger polity where the rising tide should help all minorities? Um, I'll, I'll give you my final thought after I take a couple of questions. Um, okay, well, we only have one minute left. So um, this is not a one minute question, but I'll ask it anyway. And then maybe you can respond to that and do your closing in, in one somehow. Um, <clears throat> but the question um, is about shifting alliances. So, you know, where you were just going, but you were planting the seeds for it earlier when you were talking about Brandeis, for example, and the civil rights cases. Um, you know, a lot of people have noted um, allyships that we thought were solid before October 7th um, that no longer seem to be solid. And I wonder, you know, we could talk for another hour and a half at least about that, but I wonder, you know, specifically as a historian, um, if you have any additional light to shed on that in, in the last minute. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to be I think we're going to be um, trying to figure that out for a long time. Uh, I, I keep going back to a, a full page, um, not really an ad, a headline in the New York Times sometime in October of this past year. Uh, and it, it said something like, um, these are the people who I, who I marched with for decades. Where are they now? Um, why am I deserted by by um, my fellow activists? Why am I so alone? And and it's a quote from an American Jew. I purposely didn't talk about October seventh or the aftermath because it's impossible to know now. Um, I think that by giving this whole sort of smorgasbord of different ways that the American Jewish community has been active in uh, in so many issues over approximately a century, uh, I, that that's my ray of hope. 
that you that we can't rely on any one method of particular uh, political participation, whether it's rallying, demonstrating, educating, legal um, uh, legal methods, legislation, et cetera. Um, we need to employ all of them. We need to act and vote um, and continue to educate. And that's very, very hard when people refuse, when people on the other side refuse to engage and even to create a, a forum where Jews can be exchanged. But, um, but I also have learned from studying politics for a long time that there is a not so silent majority out there of people who are not so firmly um, you know, entrenched in their beliefs. And it is important, even if you feel like you're shouting into the wind, uh, it's important to continue to, to do so, to maintain uh, our, our right to, to have rights, to push back on narratives of Jews having power because, um, hey, I would like to have more, but, um, but it's, that's actually not the case. Um, uh, Jews um, uh, being privileged, uh, there, there's a degree of privilege that comes from, um, you know, from, from, from working and, uh, and from the fact that this is a very racist country and that most Jews um, admittedly um, uh, don't look um, black. Uh, but, uh, but there is, um, there's a, a very, unfortunately, uh, a compelling case to be made for American Jews being vulnerable and of course, world Jews, uh, world Jewry being vulnerable. And to remind people of that, although it's painful to have to do that, to remind people of our history of coalition building again and again and again, I'm amazed constantly at how few people are aware of that and not doing it with a roll of the eyes. And I've seen this before and, you know, and I've seen pictures of Heschel and King marching before, because frankly, most people have not seen this, have not heard of this. They don't know of the founding of the NAACP or of the work, the anti-racist work of, of Jewish unions. They don't know about the fights for women's rights against human trafficking and and uh, into the 60s and 70s. So continuing to educate, continuing to stand up and say these things. And also, I do have to say, um, I mentioned Sylvie Jury at the end, uh, recognizing that it's also okay to care about yourselves and your own community um, and um, and not not being ashamed to do that as well, but doing it as a, as a positive, uh, virtue, not as a, um, a punitive negative response. So sorry that went on a little longer than oh, you, you packed a lot into that. So, so thank you so much. I think that's a very helpful note to end on and a, and a helpful way to see everything that you presented to us for the last, um, hour and a half. So, so it, it's, it's, um, it's a very, it's a very positive and sort of action oriented reminder and, and reminder of our history and, and of what's possible. So thank you so much for kicking off the series for us and for teaching sure. today. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us today. I wanna invite you back next week, June 24th. Um, the session is on American Jews and the politics of abortion. Um, taught by Dr. Rachel Cranson, who's also a Keck's Graduate School uh, alum and Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Another alum who does us proud in the world. Um, but for today, thank you so much again to Dr. Lawrence Strauss for teaching and, and beginning the series. Thanks, everybody. Bye.